All right, well, let me just say welcome everyone tonight to uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, and we are on session number three, and uh, your assignment was to read those chapters that relate to the epistles, which is uh, chapters three and four, so you guys know that. Uh, I won't ask you if it was hard to read or not. I know the answer to that question. Uh, I won't ask you if you read it or not. I mean, some of you probably started and thought, I think I'll hear the Cliff Notes version and see how it goes from there, because it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It doesn't seem like that heavy of a book, and yet you start to read it, and it does feel a little bit heavy. Uh, terms, ideas, uh, a lot going on there. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do both of those chapters. The first chapter does the Paul's world, the epistle's world, the Bible's world. The next chapter does how do we take that bridge in, into our world. So the exegesis is the term for the looking at it in the past, and then the hermeneutics is the fancy word for bringing it into the present. So session three is on the epistles, and the chapter is subtitled, Learning to Think Contextually. Um, when we use the word exegesis, which is it's a hard word to kind of keep in your mind, maybe you should just think in terms of the word context. What we're looking at is the historical context in which it's written. So if you're reading the Gospels, what is a Pharisee, what is a Sadducee, who is Herod, that kind of thing. What is the geography of the land? The other is the literary context, which is the actual words written down in the Bible, how they sit inside a sentence, how they sit inside a paragraph, how they sit inside a book, how they sit inside a whole collection of books, and, and so on. So that's what we're learning to do is, is look at those two, two things. Now, when we come to the epistles, and those are the writings of Paul in the New Testament and James and Jude and John, um, the, the appearance that we get, and this is what the author talks about at the beginning, is what it appears that these writings are easy. Uh, they're known to not be, but it appears that they're easy. So, for example, it, he talks about Romans 3.23 that says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, we don't need anybody to explain that to, mu to us. Most of us can understand pretty easily as to what that might mean. But if we're reading in Corinthians and it starts talking about food sacrificed to idols and you say in, the, in a Sunday school class or just as you're sitting with someone, now how do we apply that in today's world? You're suddenly facing a totally different set of problems. And so that is why we really need to think about uh, how we learn to do this contextually. So let's start with the most basic question. What is an epistle? And for the test, you need to remember that an epistle is the wife of an apostle. I mean, all, all of you will, will remember that. That is the standard answer. Epistoles is Greek for a letter. It is a letter. And what's interesting is at the late 1800s, archaeologists working in the north of Africa in Egypt discovered one of the largest collection of ancient writings from the ancient world. It's at a place called Oxyrhynchus, and they're there's something like a million documents. Uh, only like 1% of them have ever even been able to be translated. They're kept in uh, museums around the world and libraries at Oxford and other places. It is a massive project that's taken more than 100 years and they're still working on it. But one of the things that they discovered was just tons of personal letters sent before the time of Jesus, at the time of Jesus, after the time of Jesus. When, when that began to be discovered, what was realized is that the letters we have in the New Testament were somewhat similar to these ancient letters, um, but also different. In the, in, the, in the chapter talks about this guy named Adolf Deisman who did the research on this, and what he found was that there was a similar structure. There's an author, you can kind of see that little word up there, there's a recipient, and then there's an actual formal, formal structure of greeting, body, final greeting, and farewell. And so, there's something similar to the way letters were back then as we get to the letters of the New Testament, but they were also different. And that's why this guy said there's such a thing as a letter and then there's such a thing as an epistle and really wanted to emphasize the difference of an epistle because what we have in the epistles is so much more than what you have in a personal letter. For example, in the New Testament, Paul writes a personal letter. Of all the 13 letters, only one's personal. It's the letter to Philemon. And the rest of them are much more expanded. Now, in trying to understand an epistle, the first thing we got to know is that it is an occasional document. 
In other words, this was not written in a vacuum. This was written between one person or persons and a group of people, and usually around a certain topic or subject or, or need that needed to be addressed. Now, as, as Paul will write his letters, he will, in the process of writing them, introduce us to things about God. Um, someone dies at Thessalonica, and he writes a letter to the first, we call it First Thessalonians, and he says uh, about death. We do not grieve as those who have no hope because we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Well, what he's doing is he's giving us theology, but he's doing it not in as a systematic way, but, he's, but it's in the context of dealing with the issues as they're happening. So an epistle gives us information about God, but it gives it to us in the midst of uh, situations that are happening. And an epistle is only one half of the conversation. So if you pick up the phone and you talk to someone and somebody can overhear what you're saying, you're only hearing half the conversation. So when we come to Paul's writings and the other New Testament writings, we do what's called mirror reading. We can only see one half of what's said. So we have to sort of imagine or try to find out what we can learn from the letters, what was happening in the context. So how do we do it? How do we do that? So all I want to do is I want to take a minute and just kind of walk you through how you would do that today, this afternoon. And in fact, I've given you a sheet that you can take home with you. This was done by Bob Utley, who's done so much work in this for many, many years. Some of you may know his work and his name. Um, but it's an exercise that you can walk through, and it literally takes you through these steps. Um, but I want to give you a simpler way of looking at it, and then you can do that on your own. The first thing we need to do if we're going to understand an epistle, let's say, for example, 1 Corinthians, is we need to read the entire thing in one setting out loud. And you say, well, why in the world would you ever do that? Because that is exactly what it was intended to do. Every letter that was written in the New Testament was delivered by someone. For example, Romans was delivered by a woman named Phoebe to, from, from Sincrea, Corinth, Sincrea to Rome. She stood in front of these little congregations and she read word for word the whole thing out loud. Uh, this is what you did, and the whole congregation listened to it. So the, the, way, the best way to, to understand is to read the whole thing in one setting out loud. And what you're doing is you're reading it to get a sense of the big view. In other words, Paul didn't write Corinthians so that you and I would remember one verse. He wrote it so that we would understand, or the original audience would understand, the big view the big picture that he's trying to get across. As you read it, you need to have a piece of paper out next to you and a pen, and you want to start identifying divisions in the text that are natural divisions. Chapters and verses, get ready for this, hold on to your, your seatbelt. <laughs> Chapters and verses are not inspired, they're not in the original, uh, they, were, they were added in the medieval period, uh, they don't belong to the original text. Forget about chapters and verses. They, they literally are a distraction. You'd almost be better to get one of these Bibles that doesn't have any at all and just look at the Bible. Avoid the Bibles that give you verse by verse. The Bible was not written verse by verse. In fact, if you look at original manuscript, there wasn't even any chapter breaks. There wasn't even any sectional breaks. You had to just know where the, the thought processes stopped and, and, and shifted. So what you want to do as you begin to read it is you want to read it as you would any other book identifying the main, main divisions. Now you want to, as you do this, you want to have a piece of paper ready and make some notes, make some observations. So if I'm going to read this doing exegesis, trying to understand it in its historical and literary context, what observations do I need to make? Well, these, these are the things you're looking for. Who's it written to? You say, oh, there's no way I could ever possibly know that. If you, if you brought your Bible tonight, you're going to get a special prize. But it's first, if you opened up to any New Testament letter by Paul, let's just take 1 Corinthians for example, and you were to just read the opening line, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, which by the way shows you there's a dual authorship, which a lot of people don't realize that about New Testament letters. There's often multiple authors. Then it says, to the church of God in Corinth. So you know who the recipient is because the letter just told you. 
And as you read it, you'll learn more about the recipients as you continue on. Um, you want to know who the author or authors are. You'll want to read it most importantly and most difficultly, trying to understand the occasion. Because the author and recipient's not that complicated. Most of us know Paul wrote the letter to Corinth. But why? What's the circumstances? What, in order to understand what he's saying, you have to know why he's saying it. And so what you want to do is you want to read it, and you think, well, I could never know that. You would be shocked if you went home right now and sat down with 1 Corinthians and said, why did Paul write this? Suddenly, bells would be going off in your head as you would read through it going, wow, I never knew that's why he did that. And as you think about it and as you observe it, you would actually figure out a whole lot of things that you would have to find in books and in Sunday school material in order to know about. And then you want to observe the divisions. So in the text, um, in our modern Bibles, there's headings. Those also aren't inspired, but they're very helpful. In fact, get out a bunch of different Bibles and look at lots of different headings and see where they, they, they separate it, where they start new paragraphs, because that's really helpful in getting a sense of the flow of the thought. Then we need to get some help. And the two recommendations the book gives us is a dictionary and a commentary. Um, all the main publishing houses do great jobs with their dictionaries. Baker, Erdman's, IVP, all big Christian publishing houses, all their dictionaries are great. Unlike the English dictionary, you look up Corinthians or Romans, it's going to tell you about it. It's going to give you background information. A Bible commentary, this is a single volume one by, by Craig Keener. He, th there's a New Testament, an Old Testament. You get out one of those and it'll start to give you information to help you understand it. These are tools that will help you get a sense of the historical context, literary context, and help you begin to read it. All right, what I want us to do now is to shift gears and do a little bit of this. I want us to just take a little bit of time, um, and by little I mean little, uh, and, and do a little bit of this. Um, so let's say, for example, 1 Corinthians. We were to get out the book, and we were to read it, and we were to follow the instructions we've been given, 16 chapters, and we were to sit down and read it. And we notice the recipients, because I just read those to you. They're Corinth. You'd notice the author, Paul, we would notice something about the occasion. Now, if you read the whole book, you would discover a lot more about the occasion. You would discover, for example, in verse 11, that Paul, who is in Ephesus, by the way, across the, across the sea, not too far away, has been visited. Someone has come knocking on Paul's door, and they are from the household of a church, of the church at Corinth, called Chloe's household. So everything that's happening in this letter is regarding a visit that, 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 that has happened where Paul has been visited by this person. You get to the seventh chapter, and you realize that they've also given Paul a letter. So can you just imagine Paul has gotten this letter, he's gotten this visit, now he's going to respond to the letter. Do you know that everything from chapter 7 to the end of the book is a response to that letter? You'll watch as you read through chapter 7 on, it'll say, and about this and about this, and about this. And they're topic after topic after topic that this church had written Paul about because they wanted answers regarding these questions. Is that important to understand if we're going to try to understand the book of 1 Corinthians, that Paul is answering a question they're asking? So if they say, all things are permissible for you, he's not saying that. He's quoting them, and he's responding to what they're saying. That's really important. Because he's not saying all things are permissible for you. And then you get to the end of the book, and you discover that he's visited by these three individuals, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. And so there's more going on in, in, in the midst of this. And then you also discover that Timothy and uh, these brothers are going to visit Corinth and perhaps bring the letter and so now you're seeing this whole entire situation develop and the dynamics that are at play and at work in it. And that helps you understand that this is a letter written not in a vacuum, but in the middle of a questions and struggles to figure out the answers to those questions. Now, as you do this, you not only want to get the big divisions of the text, but then you want to get some of the smaller subdivisions. So if you took, for example, the first six chapters, there's 16 chapters in Corinthians, and you were to do big groupings, 
you would do chapters one through four, something like the divisions of the church, because the church is divided. The incestuous man, the lawsuits in chapter six, the sexual immorality issue in chapter six. Then, remember what I said about the abouts? Starting in chapter seven, about behavior within marriage, about virgins, about food sacrifice styles. These are questions they had asked, because you might have been saying to yourself, and why would Paul bring all these strange topics up? He didn't. I don't think he wanted to talk about these things. They brought him up, and he's having to respond to them, and he probably was glad he's writing about it rather than having to be present. In chapter 11, he talks about the covering of women's heads in worship, the abuse of the Lord's Supper, which, by the way, everything we know about the Lord's Supper, we come because they were mishandling it. Chapter 12 through 14 are spiritual gifts and bodily resurrection, collection, the return of Apollos, and so on. So then you get a sense of that. When I took Corinthians as a class in seminary, we had to memorize the full outline of the book of Corinthians. We walked into a test and we wrote it all out. I got to tell you, when you get it inside your head and you can think, okay, it's here and it's here and it's here and it's here, you get a sense of what the big picture is. You really start to understand what he is dealing with. Now, as you do, the idea of the book is you just continue to go into smaller sections as you work through this, and the the, the page I gave you shows you how to do this. What it suggests is you do multiple readings. You do one reading, big reading, and then you do multiple readings, and you work through, and you get more and more details. If you were to do that in chapters one through four, you would just do it, and then you would make some observations, and you would notice the church is quarreling. You would notice there's problems with Paul, and you would notice that there is a failure to understand what the gospel actually is. So as you're working through this as an assignment, you would have discovered the recipients, the author, the occasion, the natural divisions. And then finally, I want to just repeat kind of what I said at the beginning. We need to learn to think in terms of paragraphs. This is so important. We, not, we need to break free from our desire to only memorize a verse and learn to see the big section. Nobody only thinks in terms of just single snippets of anything. We want to understand the big ideas and the big concepts as we work through it. So that's exegesis, and you say, that is a lot. Well, if you read the next chapter, you know that the author said, that's the easy part, because that's a part where we know what we're supposed to do. When we get into this chapter called Epistles and Hermeneutics, there is no agreement on how we're supposed to handle this. This is the Wild West of trying to handle the Bible. And people say, why are there so many denominations? This is why there's so many denominations. Now, why does he write the chapter? The goal of the chapter is to show the weakness of what he calls a common hermeneutics, the way in which people rely on common sense exclusively to make their determinations. And the other is he wants us to understand the problem of cultural relativity. It was 2,000 years ago. They didn't have chimneys. They didn't have candles. They didn't have iPhones. I mean, this was primitive. It was a different world. So let's talk about these common hermeneutics that, it, that the chapter deals with. We all do hermeneutics. When we pick up the Bible and we read it, we do it automatically. And oftentimes we make determinations about things without anyone having to tell us. So the example in the book is 2 Timothy 4.13 when Paul writes to Timothy and he says, he's sitting in prison, he says, hey Timothy, when you come and you're going down this way, would you stop off in Troas? Would you go by and see my friend Carpus? I left my jacket over there. And it's cold in this Roman cell. Would you bring it? So it says, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas. The authors make a point. No one's reading the Bible and says, you know what God wants me to do today? He wants me to go to Troas and find a cloak and deliver it to some guy named Paul. Nobody thinks that. Why do we know that? It's common sense, isn't it? The problem, and the author makes this really good point, is we don't do this consistently in Scripture. We kind of pick this willy-nilly, and often we do it based on our church traditions, our own personal theological heritage, our own cultural norms. But the problem is, is our own common sense comes from us, and it comes from our own culture. So how could we do this, how could we do this better? Well, just to kind of further show you the problem, let's just illustrate it. 
The New Testament gives the following as a list of instructions. It tells us that if you have a stomach ache, you should drink wine. It doesn't say what version of it or how much of it. Paul says to Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach. Should we always drink wine every time we have a stomach ache? This is a hermeneutical question. The Bible says that it's, uh, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And it's a shame for women to have short hair. Does that mean we should not grow out long hair and cut, not cut our hair short? In 1 Corinthians 14, it says women should be silent in the church. Should, is, is that make sense if in 1 Corinthians 11 it says when a woman prays or prophesies? How can she be silent if she's praying and prophesying? These two things can't be true at the same time. We have a hermeneutical quandary. When Paul ta talks about the leadership of a church, he talks about elders, not pastors, and he doesn't talk about one. He talks about a lot of them. He assumes a plurality of leadership. When they want to meet the needs of the widows in the church, you have to qualify. Uh, you have to be a widow for a long time. You, uh, you have to be a person of high moral standard. You have to sit at the feet of the apostles. Not just anybody qualifies to be a widow. Are we going to say that? We're not going to help you unless you meet these requirements. What about when it says they baptize the whole entire households? We're Baptists. We don't believe in that, right? Can you baptize infants? What do, how do we make sense of these? These are hermeneutical questions. And then you get to this free will kind of predestination thing. Some verses say God predestined it, and some verses say it was free will. Arminians famously say it's free will. Calvinists fam famously say it's predestined. It can't be both. We have to make a choice. We have to use hermeneutics in order to interpret it. Now, some of you are going to say to yourselves, I just think you're making all this up, so let me give you the verses to go with all of these, <laughs> and you can screenshot those. The widows beat requirements is in the pastoral epistles. They make a point at this, and this is so important. This is the big takeaway. You ready for it? We need a lot more humility in the church. We need a lot more, they use the term, genteel conversation. There is a lot more we don't know than we think we do. Now, don't listen to the TV preachers because they will tell you we have, there's all the answers and they're readily available. But in order to do this kind of work, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some conversations. It's going to take some thinking. It's going to take some praying and working through it. So how do we do that? Well, the basic rule that governs all of hermeneutics is that a text can never mean what it never meant. It can never mean something that it never meant. We can't take a, an interpretation from a passage in the Bible and say, well, it means this. Well, but we know Paul really didn't mean that. No, it has to be authorial intent. It has to be, in order to be the word of God, the inspired word of God, it has to be expressed by the author. So that is the basic principle. The, the uh, example they use in the book is about speaking in tongues. Uh, a number of very famous preachers have come out against this and called it, uh, they've, it's called the cessational view, that, that there are no longer spiritual gifts of any kind. And they base it off of 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter. It says, uh, it says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. And then it says, tongues will cease. 1 Corinthians 13, 10. Somebody said, well, see, speaking in tongues is going to go away. It's called the cessationist view. But you go read 1 Corinthians 13 this, this evening and you'll know immediately that's not what Paul's saying. There's absolutely no way that that is what he's communicating, nor is he implying. The text cannot mean what it never meant. So it forces us to go back and, and think through that. Uh, a second rule has to do with the comparables. If we're going to take the Bible... 2,000 years ago and make it work in our world today, it has to be a comparable situation. We can't take something in one place and then something in another place and they're totally dissimilar and be able to make an application. So this is the, this is the rule. Whenever we share compared particulars, similar specific life situations with the first century hearers, God's word to us is the same as God's word to them. But if the situations are different, we have to figure it out. So put another way, it must be a clear and genuinely comparable situation. So Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Comparable, eternal, timeless. But what about 
1 Corinthians 6. Remember 1 Corinthians 6? Paul says, uh, some of you are taking each other to court. Should Christians sue each other? I've had a number of people in the church many times say to me, I would never do such a thing because Paul says you're not supposed to take other Christians to court. But I wonder if they would think that if they understood the Roman court. I wonder if they would understand that in a Roman system, uh, when you took someone to court, uh, two Christians were standing in the marketplace in front of a pagan judge. An audience was standing around. I wonder if they had understood this, if they understood that a lawyer that represented them wasn't seeking justice, he was seeking to publicly humiliate the other person. Go read about Roman courts. Go read, for example, Cicero, who I've enjoyed spending a lot of time reading over the last few years, and his whole goal is to absolutely publicly annihilate his opponent, and it is, it is absolute public assassination. So if that's the goal of Roman courts, then what Paul is saying is, don't humiliate each other in public. He's not even talking about specifically taking people to court. In other words, the modern court system doesn't compare with the Roman court system. They are incomparable. And in order to do proper hermeneutics, we have to look at the context. Another example is eating meat. Now, I know the first one you weren't really bothered by, but have you read in Corinthians where Paul talks about not eating meat? You say, that is not Texan. And that is not Baptist. But if you go back and read in Corinth, every time you bought meat, where did it come from? It came from a place where it was sacrificed in the public square before a pagan god. It was handled by pagan priests. So the question in everybody's home was, if I invite you over to my house, should I have this food that's been sacrificed to gods, pagan gods served in the midst of a meal? What about the Lord's Supper with pagan god meat? Should you do that or not? And this becomes Paul's great analogy about whether or not Christians can eat food sacrificed to idols. Uh, you can go read the chapter if you want to know his answer to all that because it's really long and complicated. But if we were to then take it a little bit further, which is what do we do in order to extend the application in our world? There, there are two analogies that are used that, that deserve our attention. One is have you ever heard someone say, don't smoke because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3. Well, if you read the chapter, you know the authors say that's a misunderstanding because the passage that says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit is 1 Corinthians 3, and it's not talking about your body. It's talking about the church, actually. And in 1 Corinthians 6, it's talking about your physical body. So in other words, the passage that's being quoted isn't even the passage that applies to that. A, hermi a hermeneutical process requires that the text that we have in front of us applies to the situation that we're dealing with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's talking about a division within the church. In 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about idolatry. Two totally different issues than the way people think of things like that today. The other example they use in the book has you ever heard someone say, you should not marry this person who's not a Christian because you are not equally First, 2 Corinthians 6.14. And yet, you go and read 2 Corinthians 6.14 about being unequally yoked. It doesn't say anything about marriage, actually. It's actually talking about something totally different. Again, it's talking about pagan idolatry and going to temples. In other words, the, the application may be sound biblical advice. It's just not from that verse. That's not the verse you want to go, go looking at in order to draw that application. Now, there are things that the, uh, that the passage describes as matters of indifference, meaning when Paul comes to meat sacrifice to idols, you know what his end result is? He says you can eat it if you want. He said there's actually, and it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't change the quality of the meat because it's been sacrificed. He says, but if a brother or sister comes in and they think you're participating in pagan worship, you need to cut it out for their sake. Well, they leave, go to town. It's a matter of indifference. I have this saying, I love to quote the Rupertus Mendius, that in, in essentials, unity, non-essentials, liberty, and all things charity, this is a freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, honest Christians are going to disagree about a lot of matters of indifference. Food sacrifice to idols is simply one of those. Now, there is one caveat. 
Because some of the people in the congregation then, and I think sometimes in congregations today, will say to themselves, well, I don't do that, and I am more holy than everyone else. And that Paul had no stomach for. Thank you. Thank you for laughing at that. The whole chapter is on cultural relativity. What do we do with this ancient text in this modern situation? One option is we can reject it wholesale and go with trying to do things the way they were in the first century, try to be kind of like a cultural Amish person. The other is to reject it because the world is 2,000 years different. What we really want to do is we want to translate it into our modern culture. But to do this, we need to know what is not culturally relative. Things that are not culturally relative are the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. They're New Testament morality, and they're the unified witness of the scriptures. What we mean by that is we don't just look at one verse, we look at all of them. If we have one verse and we're not really sure what it means or how to apply it, we look at other verses. So in the passage that speaks of women being silent in the church, it's important to know that there's Romans 16 that talks about women deacons and, uh, and Junia, an apostle, and Priscilla who taught uh, Apollos who would become a pastor. So we want to we balance it out by the larger view of all the scriptures and let the other scriptures speak into the passage that we're less clear about. Now I want to finish by saying that a principle from scripture can be applied differently in different circumstances. In other words, we could take the same verse and apply it totally differently today. When Paul said that women should wear a head covering at Corinth, it was because the absence of it created a disorder in the church. Today, if a woman walks in wearing a burqa, is that going to create disorder in the church? Probably a whole lot more than if, wearing, uh, th than if not. In other words, you could actually have the opposite pr application of the original principle depending on your cultural context. If we were in Africa, if we were in Europe, if we were in Asia, if we were in uh, other parts of the United States, if we were in Austin, <laughs> it's going to be different. When I was in China, I was amazed that the pastors in the, in the seminary classes I were in, more than half of them were women. Master's degrees and doctoral, doctoral degrees. The most educated people in these churches were these, these uh, vocational women who had, had, who had highly educated backgrounds and were very successful. And it was a reminder to me how culturally we look at these things because we've never seen it in one particular way or another. Just know what is not culturally relative and then let's have humility. I'm three minutes over, so I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. Father, we just thank you tonight for the opportunity that we have to try to understand your word. We pray, God, that as we look back into the ancient world, into the ancient text, we pray that you would speak to us. God, we pray that as we put it into application in our lives, into our church, God, we pray that we would do it in a way that is truly what your, what your will is and what your desire is for us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.